praise be the grandfather, he has finally released me from his clutches. Now, I don't sound like a completely snot-filled, disgusting bag of filth, but, you know, progress. In a couple videos previously, I've deep-dived into the Emperor and kind of explained his divination, his powers of foresight, as well as just how he exists both in the warp and real space, so I want to expand upon that today. We're going to be going over the strongest psychers that we've seen in 40k, and the key word there is what we've seen. We're not going to be going off stuff that we've, you know, heard about through myth and legend, like the old ones or something like that. We are only going off from feats that we have seen or read in the books. So before we even get to the top 10, let's get some honorable mentions out of the way. Right out the gate, we're just going to disqualify all of the big four, because technically Zinch is the father of all magic, and he would be the strongest psyker, but he is quite literally just an amalgamation of emotions, so it doesn't really feel fair to count them. The old ones are also disqualified because, well, everything we know about them is just mythology. It's said that they're supposed to be, like, the strongest psychers ever, but we haven't seen any feats of it, and again, it kind of falls into the same category as Zinch, where they are gods, so can you really count it? The next honorable mention has to be Tigurius, because currently in the 40k setting, I'd say he is in the top 10 strongest psychers, but when you're considering the entire setting over its 40 year history, sadly he only fits into like 14, 15, maybe even 16th slot. We do have to give Tigurius credit though, he's probably the honorable mention that I will give the most credit to, because he did kind of peer directly into the Tyranid hive mind. Granted, it was like looking through one tiny pipe at a lake, but he still saw a Lovecraftian creature and didn't commit log off, so he gets some points. Iskander Kaon would probably be lower on the list if he had more recognized feats in the books, or if he was you know, more honest, but yeah, you win some, you lose some. He's still strong, probably like number 16, but he's worth discussing. And lastly, to round off the honorable mentions, we have Kairos Fate Weaver. As well as being the epitome of Drip, Kairos is said to be the strongest of all of Zinch's greater demons, and is said to know every single sorcery. Take that with a pinch of salt, considering that Zinch is both the father of trickery and magic, so, you know. Alright, now that we're done discussing the first losers, we can get into the people that actually matter. Number 10 is Azek Araman. Araman was the former first captain of the Thousand Suns Legion, and is conveniently also the father of all of the currently alive Sand People. If we're being technical, Araman is the second strongest servant of Zeech, just eking out Kairos Fate Weaver. But what really sets Armin apart, and what really makes him a unique Psyker and a class above all other Space Marines, aside from maybe three or four, is that Armin is probably the single most well-spread out or well-balanced Psyker in all of 40k. I hesitate to say that he's really mastered Biomancy, considering that the Rubric Marines are still sand, and that doesn't seem to be changing anytime soon, but he still deserves credit for being damn good. Telekinesis and telepathy are probably his strongest suits, or the fields of magic that he is most comfortable or strongest in, but that doesn't mean that he's not well versed in both divination, pyromancy, and demonology. Araman did the equivalent of a drive-by brain scan where they were floating in space and he just decided he was going to read thousands of minds as they were flying by, like it was nobody's business. If you thought the US government were stealing your data, it is nothing compared to what Zinch is doing. But in my personal opinion, his most impressive feat is actually being faster than an Eldar Harlequin, who are supposed to be the fastest of the fastest. A regular Eldar is already faster than the human eye can keep up with, and a Harlequin is leagues above that, so the fact that Araman is able to keep up with that is truly insane. Granted, that is both in part divination and telekinesis, but still, it, it's impressive. Number 9 on the list is really not even up for debate. It is Kaldor Drago, current Grand Master, or Head Grand Master, whatever it is. Grey Knight ranks are confusing, convoluted, and frankly, I don't care. Where the Eldar Harlequins are the fastest of the fast, Kaldor Drago is basically the best demon killer of all demon killers. He is the closest analog to Doom Guy that we actually have in 40k. Granted, we don't know a ton about his feats, but the fact that he is just in the warp, walking around, and many demons are just actively avoiding him. 
I guess the closest thing I could compare it to is restoration magic in Skyrim, specifically things that are focused on repelling the undead. He has the equivalent of a circle around him, and if you are a demon, you just instantly burn. Anything but the strongest of greater demons, demon primarchs, demon princes, any of those, you are just getting burned. And even if you are one of those really strong demons, be you an independent demon, greater demon, whatnot, Kaldor almost certainly knows your name, and he will, without question, just send you back to your respective Chaos God. While Drago isn't the strongest physical psychic combatant, that would probably go to someone like Magnus the Red, or maybe even Zinch directly, Drago has spent almost every single point available into the resistance skill tree, and all of the rest of his skill points went into attacks or powers that are directly focused at countering demons or countering warp influence as a whole. In the simplest terms, Drago is just running around the warp with Repel Undead in his left hand and Dawnbreaker in the right hand. He only cares about demons, and if you are a demon, he is your worst enemy, aside from maybe Biggie. Number 8 is kind of contentious, and if you want to swap it with number 9, I completely understand. But in my opinion, number 8 goes to Reveal Arvita, and specifically after he has ascended and become Janus, first Grandmaster of the Grey Knights. Two of the things that really make Janus stand out amongst all the other peoples in the list is the fact that he trained directly under the tutelage of Malkador the Sigilite, who is almost without question considered to be the strongest human psyker ever. And if that wasn't enough, he was also given a shard of Magnus the Red, Primarch of the Thousand Suns Legion and the strongest psyker Primarch. Janus is definitely more well-rounded than Kaldor Drago, but he definitely still has a significant number of stat points put into Demon Repellent or just Repel Undead. A side note on this guy, this doesn't really count towards his power scaling or anything like that, but he is the last Loyalist Thousand Sons, or at least the only notable Loyalist Thousand Sons. Also, allegedly he founded the Blood Ravens, but that's neither here nor there. His main psychic feats, which you could argue one of them isn't a psychic feat because it wasn't cast successfully, but he got them most of the way there, so it counts. The event in question is when Jagatikon and the White Scars were sent through the webway by Janus, or at this point, Revia Larvita. This did result in him succumbing to the flesh change, which was the inevitable fate of almost every Thousand Sons, even if you committed yourself to Zinch. There was still enough there for it to be salvaged and infused with the Shard of Magnus, Reveal Arvita officially died and we are given Janus, first Grandmaster of the Grey Knights. It's assumed that he's dead, but considering that he's a Grandmaster of the Grey Knights, he could be with Kaldor Drago and they're just walking around having a merry time. We don't officially know. Moving on to number 7, we have Mephiston, who is arguably the strongest space marine psyker ever. And the reason I put him above Janus is the fact that he does not have a shard of Magnus the Red in them. He instead has a shard of Sanguinius. For those of you who aren't familiar with the lore of the Blood Angels, the genetic curse of Sanguinius and his sons is the Black Rage as well as the Red Thirst. Both of those on their own are considered death sentences, but Mephiston is the only person ever to have beaten both of them. Now, the Black Rage and the Red Thirst on their own might not sound that bad, but keep in mind that these are thousand pound demigods in power armor, and they are able to essentially fall into a power fantasy or power trip. Which, for normal people, that would be terrible, but these are vampires. So all they can think about is killing you and eating you. So he definitely gets bonus points for that. At all times, he is spending at least 2 or 3% of his power not focusing on eating the closest flesh bag around. While we don't have any examples of Mephiston using biomancy, demonology, or divination to any real extent, yes, we have seen minor examples, it seems that Mephiston put every single point in his psychic ability tree towards offensive abilities. Araman, being an expert in divination, cannot beat Mephiston because Mephiston is just an absolute freight train of psychic might. Granted, we have seen greater examples of direct psychic usage, but Mephiston spends a solid 50% of his power at any given time 
just making sure that he doesn't explode and become a chaos spawn. But the single greatest example of his power is in the devastation of Ball when they are on a Thunderhawk on their way to complete a ritual. A cadre of librarians are essentially using all of their psychic might to keep the Thunderhawk going and to repel the absolute swarm of Tyranid Gaunts and other flying creatures. Mephiston, being the absolute chad that he is, says open the back door and jumps out without a jump pack. All the librarians are calm, but there's a single young initiate on the ship who freaks out and goes, wait, you forgot your jump pack, only for an older librarian to tell him, strap in, buckle your seatbelt, it's about to get real. In probably the second most angelic display we have ever seen in 40k, outside of Horus and Sanguinius' own duel aboard the Vengeful Spirit, Mephiston essentially takes on the visage of the angel Sanguinius himself, grows a pair of blood-red angel wings, and just starts casting psychic lightning like it's nobody's business. In the matter of minutes, Mephiston had managed to kill hundreds if not thousands of gargoyles, gaunts, crones, harpies, anything you can imagine, Mephiston just vaporized it on contact. And you might be thinking, wow, that's pretty awesome, but I don't see why that would put him at the number one spot. Well. He then pushes a warp storm and uses it as a battering ram to add up even more Tyranid kills. Mephiston essentially used the warp storm like a cow catcher on a freight train, just absolutely melting a hole in the front lines, allowing the Thunderhawk to successfully make its way to the ritual. And then he just gets back into the ship like it's nobody's business. And if you're thinking, oh, he just killed thousands of lesser Tyranid bioforms, no, Hive Crones and Harpies are essentially Apache helicopters and F-22s. And the Gargoyles, which are probably the lesser of the flying Tyranid bioforms, are still the size of a person. This shows without question the strongest uses of pyromancy as well as telekinesis. I don't know why lightning is considered pyromancy, but I don't know, I guess all destruction magic is just pyromancy when you think about it. Now, something that I previously mentioned is that we really only are going off from feats that we have seen in the lore. I don't remember if it was a Necron or an Eldar themselves, but they commented on Mephiston's psychic power that he was just barely approaching what the Eldar's psychic might was back during the War in Heaven. This is the Age of Mythology, so we're really not going to count that. Five and six are another contentious couple, so feel free to put either of these in whatever position you think they're deserving of, but I believe number six is Magnus the Red. Primarch of the Thousand Suns Legion, and famous for doing literally everything wrong, grandfather of the Sand People, and the only Primarch that I have seen get Arthur Bones so mad that he starts screaming. Magnus was essentially tailor-made to sit on the Golden Throne and either protect the human webway or keep it open. It's not sure which, but I'm gonna assume it is keeping it open. And considering that the Emperor was able to seemingly construct new webway portals, we can assume that the Golden Throne itself would eventually be moved into the webway. Now, for those of you who are gonna say that Malkador should be lower than Magnus, or technically higher on the list, Keep in mind that Magnus is half demon and he was designed to sit on the chair. Malkador was a last minute oh shit fix. But again, we do have to give Magnus credit. He is an absolute master in every single school of magic. Now, technically Magnus could be the strongest Primarch at any given time, but that's more so him pulling a vision and able to change every single aspect of his physical form at will. On two different occasions, we've seen Magnus essentially just grow to the size of a titan, punch it in the face, do the default dance, and walk away like it was nobody's business. Yeah, a couple of thousand sons died, but you know, you gotta break some eggs to make some omelets. Also, the fact that he was able to put on the greatest psychic performance in all of 40k, bar none, and this is during the burning of Prospero when he's fighting Lehman Russ, Guy has a WWE-style entrance as he walks down from the sky to an arena. He basically makes a cage out of lightning and challenges him to a steel cage match. Granted, he did still lose this, but if he didn't spend so much of his power on performance and keeping the cage up, I'm sure he could have done a little more damage. Lehman didn't walk away clean. 
To Magnus's credit, though, he was being surrounded by Sisters of Silence, and there's really nothing you can do when the warp just stops existing around you. For those of you who don't know, Sisters of Silence are essentially sponges of the warp. They just create like a field around them where magic doesn't exist, and if you use magic or rely on magic, well, sucks to suck. And even though this really isn't something he should get credit for, it is a massive psychic feat to have been able to breach the barrier that the Emperor put around the soul system. Granted, this is the thing that he's most known for, and the Emperor's plan would have failed regardless, it's worth mentioning that he did breach a shield put up by the Emperor himself. I think this here is the single strongest Magnus has ever been, because not only is he a Primarch at full power, but he's empowered by Zinch, as well as the dozen or so psychers that were surrounding him. That being said, at that moment, with Zinch's power-up and the dozen or so psychers, I would say he is stronger than Malkador, but again, there is a lot of buffing going on there. At number four, we have the strongest human psyker ever, who conveniently is just a baseline human. That being Malkador the Sigilite. Right out the gate, I'll just admit my favoritism, this is one of my favorite 40k characters of all time. Dude just pushed an entire moon into the webway like it was nobody's business. Which, granted it is the webway, so it doesn't require the psychic intensity that the, you know, warp would, but it's still impressive. You're essentially moving Africa and Asia into a, just a pocket dimension. Add to that, he seems to have mastered either charms or runes or something of the sort, because if he just, like, draws a little thing on you, you're just immune to everything in the warp. In the end of the Death Volume 3, one of the custodians survived only because Malkador, for some reason he used his tongue, but inscribed this rune onto this custodes, and that prevented him from just getting melted by the chaos-empowered Horus. Add to that, he sat on the Golden Throne for a couple of hours, although technically time didn't exist because they were in the inevitable city at this time, not technically on Terra. So he either could have spent an infinite amount of time on that throne, or a minute, or a second, or whatever. In my opinion, it's somewhere in between, and we're gonna say two hours. While yes, he was immortal, he wasn't tailor-made like Magnus was to sit on the throne. Magnus, keep in mind, like all Primarchs, had 50% demon inside of him, and so he was built to withstand the overwhelming psychic draw that was the Golden Throne. Because remember, it's not that the Golden Throne keeps the Emperor alive. The Emperor keeps the Golden Throne alive, which means that Malkador was essentially giving 100, or I guess 99.9% .9 of his power, to just keep the psychic lighthouse going. And this was just a normal guy. Granted, again, he was immortal, but this is just some dude with the same flesh and bones that you and I do, sitting on a chair built for an actual demigod. And the last psychic feat that I want to mention, which is arguably the most contentious, is when Malkador just straight up force choked Horus and almost killed him. For those of you who aren't aware, Horus approached Malkador because the two missing Primarchs were having their statues removed, and Horus believed that they should still be honored, they were still his brothers. And in an attempt to protest, or I guess rebel against authority, Horus, in his rage, tried to speak the name of one of the Primarchs, and Malkador, from across the room, just force chokes him. And Horus didn't show up alone. He had Jagatai Khan, the fastest Primarch, and maybe the strongest, I don't know, depends on if you're following the Dragon Ball Z logic of power scaling. And Alpharius, who actually might have been Omegon pretending to be Alpharius, but neither here nor there, Alpha Legion, someone was there. Melkador had to be begged by Jagatai Khan and Alpharius not to kill Horus, which means that Malkador had the ability and was willing to just absolutely murder probably the strongest Primarch at that time. I don't mean physical strongest, but he was the strongest presence of the Primarchs. He was the face of the Imperium, essentially. Now, you could argue the fact that Jagatai Khan and Alpharius didn't just kill Malkador was the fact that he was basically their uncle. Malkador, without question at this point, was the most important human within the Imperium. It went Big E, and then Valdor and Malkador were fighting for the second and third spot. So, it is fair to say that they weren't necessarily unable to kill him, they were just afraid of really angering their father. Big E was already a borderline sociopath, at the very least apathetic to humanity. He would have 100% wiped out all three of those Primarchs if they killed his best friend. 
without question. But I really do choose to believe that Malkador could have killed any or all three of those Primarchs. Granted, it probably would have taken a considerable amount of his psychic might, he could have done it. At number four, we have the illustrious Eldrad Uthran of Craftward U Craft World Uthwe. While yes, we have seen individuals who have matched him in a single specific class of magic, we haven't seen him even close to his actual full power. For those of you who aren't familiar with Eldar lore, which is probably 85% of the community, the Eldar Farseers wear these wraith helmets to physically limit their power to stop themselves from just immediately being absorbed by chaos. Keep this in mind when we're looking at some of his psychic feats that, yes, while being extremely impressive, wouldn't be something that makes him the strongest on their own, but the fact that he does not allow himself to hit a certain power level certainly does. Eldred is also one of few characters who exists both in the warp and in real space, as we know a solid portion of his soul is stuck in the warp. Now, where Eldran truly shines is divination. One of the things that I've really focused on on this channel is how the Emperor views time and himself within it, and Eldrad is significantly better than anyone else in the story, bar none. Eldrad essentially put every single one of his points into the divination scale tree, and once that was maxed out, he just said screw it and spread them out evenly. Divination, for the less magically versed of you, is the ability to see the future or divine all possibilities. Eldrad is the premier diviner in the entire setting. He truly takes the term Farseer and lives it up to its fullest potential. He can see every single opportunity and what he needs to do, or the path of succession, for each of those possibilities to happen. Now, this does mean that he's not the best combat psyker. Like, for example, he doesn't have the demon repellent abilities of Kaldor Drago or Janus, and he certainly doesn't have the sheer destructive power of someone like Magnus the Red. So, to once again reiterate, while wearing a Wraithbone helmet that limits his magical prowess significantly, and while having a portion of himself in the warp and most of his skill points being spent on non-combat abilities, he still had the stat spread to alter his avatar, or at least alter his physical body, because he, just like Magnus, altered his form to the size of a titan and just punched it. Because if there's one thing we can take from 40k, punching can solve literally anything. Just ask the orcs. And in a weird combination of the two powers, he was able to almost kill Abaddon the Despoiler. The Chaos Gods had to just yoink him out of the situation, otherwise he was definitively dead. This isn't to say that Eldred is this savant on all aspects, it's the fact that he is able to accurately divine the future and do what he needs to do in combat to secure a victory. Take Armageddon for example, yes I know this point has been beaten into the ground, but Armageddon only happened because Eldred decided that losing a fifth of the craft world was better than losing the entire craft world, which, you know, power to you, the Imperium can lose a trillion or so souls and not even realize. Eldred also has, at minimum, 10,000 years of experience using these powers. He was a minor member of the Cabal before he just decided that shouldn't exist anymore, and has even spoken to the Master of Mankind himself. That all being said, he is, without question, the current strongest Eldar Psyker in the entire galaxy. Probably the strongest living Psyker. Now, that really does depend on your definition of living, if the Emperor is alive or in this perpetual state of undeath, but, you know, that's in the weeds at this point. And, if I haven't iterated this enough, he is wearing a helmet that puts a limit on his psychic powers. He would be significantly stronger if he didn't care about just being absorbed into Slanesh. Now, I really debated with number three because I didn't want to put something with such little lore so high on the list, but... I have to. Number three is none other than the Caco Dominus. For those of you who aren't Black Templar fans, you probably don't know what the Caco Dominus even is, and eh, I don't blame you. With a psychic might that was able to completely enthrall 1300 systems, 1300 systems, that's essentially two and a half realms of Ultramar. On the high end, this is somewhere around 5 quadrillion people, and on the low end, it's about 10 trillion. It's really dependent on how population-dense you think the Imperium really is. 
But what's unquestionable is that the Cacodominus was able to completely enthrall 1300 systems and that the entirety of the Black Templars was needed to deal with this threat. Keep in mind the Black Templars, it technically they're a chapter but they don't follow chapter rules, they're basically a legion. It's not like this was just a thousand space marines, this was probably in the order of 50,000 space marines sent to kill this thing. The victory against the Cacodominus was so monumental that the head of the beast is still held within the chapter monastery at the Black Templars to this day. At number two, we have the God Emperor of Mankind. This one really doesn't need much explaining, so I kind of want to go over some lesser known or lesser talked about feats of the Emperor just to really put his psychic prowess into perspective. Of all of the previously mentioned schools of magic, we've got biomancy, pyromancy, demonology, telekinesis, divination, and, well, I forgot the last one, so we're just gonna move on. The Emperor has a solid stat spread in every single one of them. I also forgot to mention that he is essentially the strongest demon repellent, but that may be more so to the fact that he just has the most skill points. For example, we know that Eldrad is, without a doubt, a more accurate farseer or diviner than that of the Emperor. This doesn't mean that the Emperor isn't phenomenal at divination, he was better than almost every single person within the Imperium, but that the Emperor really didn't specialize in any of the specific trees in the skill tree. It looks like he just put a solid number of points into every single skill tree. For example, he's able to hold open the human webway, which I don't really know what school of magic that is, but you know, that probably takes a couple of points. And when he's in the webway fighting, we see him use demonology and biomancy to basically control the bodies of his custodies when need be, and able to resurrect the Legion of the Damned, or the Proto-Legion of the Damned. Then, in the End of the Death Volume 2, we see him cast blatant restoration magic by just healing John Grammaticus and company. Fuck John Grammaticus. Also, I saw this in a Reddit post, so I really do want to mention this. In a lot of pictures featuring the Emperor, we see Sisters of Silence, who are essentially psychic sponges, as I previously mentioned when discussing Magnus. While being almost constantly surrounded by just psychic sponges, the Emperor is repeatedly and consistently able to divine the future and manipulate reality around him. Transmutation, telekinesis, everything. Oh, transmutation, that's the one I didn't mention earlier. But yeah, all in all, Emperor is very comfortably second spot, if not number one. In fact, I, I really don't blame you if you see the Emperor as number one, because number one is a pretty contentious one. Topping off the list, we have the Tyranid Hive Mind. Now, you might argue with this, but, you know, I'm right, you're wrong, deal with it. The Tyranid Hive Mind is essentially forced to use 100% of its psychic abilities to communicate with actual octillions of individual beings across hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of light years. That is actually unthinkable for the human brain. The Shadow and the Warp, which, keep in mind, will actually just eviscerate most psychers who even try to investigate it, or even just try to exist with Tyranids around, is just their communications. The sheer weight of their communications is enough to just cause ripples in reality. The Tyranids are so singularly focused on consumption of everything that they have found a way to essentially sever the alternate reality that our reality exists upon. A lot of people forget that the warp is a reflection of our reality or our universe, and the Tyranids are somehow able to either just completely cut off that or overpower it by sheer weight of psychic might. While your average Tyranid synapse creature is probably on par with some of the stronger human psychers, the hive mind itself rivals the psychic might of Zinch himself. Now, if you don't really like the answer of the Tyranid Hive Mind, then the real answer would be Chaos Empowered Horus during the End of the Death Volume 3, but we really only get to experience that for a half of a book, so eh, that's up to you. The only reason that the Emperor really beat Horus was because he coded in some kind of backdoor, and that backdoor was pride or arrogance, and the ex- the ex -perer exploited that to get Horus to temporarily give up his power. Now, that does mean that the Emperor was a stronger, you know, willpower or whatever, but Horus definitely, during that fight, was the strongest Psyker in all of 40k. I forgot to add Erda as an honorable mention, but the only reason I'm even mentioning her is, well, she's the mother of the Primarchs, and she banished four greater demons. 
but still, not cool enough to get on the list. Either way, thank you guys for watching. Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Let me know if you agree or disagree. Either way, I'm sticking to my guns, and I'm right.